Grace, peace, and love, family, and welcome on back in to the Bread, Wine, and Soul Food Bible Study Channel, where we deal with nothing but what thus saith the Lord. The Holy Scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation, the King James Version of the Bible, and everything that the Father and Jesus Christ has made known and revealed unto us through His Spirit of Truth, also known as the Comforter and the Holy Ghost. So with that being said, all praise honor and glory be unto the almighty god of abraham isaac and jacob in jesus name because truly without him like jesus said over here in john 15 and at the end of verse 5 but without me ye can do nothing and family you don't want to do nothing without god when god is involved everything goes well according to his plan we don't want to do nothing outside of his will all right so let's open up this bible study with job 22 and let's read verses 21 through 28. And it reads, Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Then shalt thou lay up gold as dust. And the gold of Ophir is the stones of the brooks. Yeah, the Almighty shall be thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. For then shalt thou have thy delight in the Almighty, and shalt lift up thy face unto God. Thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. And the light shall shine upon thy ways. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and application of his holy word to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So once again, peace and love, family. And welcome on in to everybody that's tuning in now and later from all around the world. We bid you peace. And we pray that the Almighty send his Holy Spirit and open up our understanding in the almighty name of Jesus Christ. So with that being said, family, what we're going to deal with today is a topic that the Lord Jesus Christ sent his Holy Spirit and inspired me to do. And that is, don't be afraid of who is elected president. God rules over kings. So what we're going to take a look at throughout the course of this Bible study is how God is the one that sets up these rulers that's appointed their offices, just in case anybody didn't know. So what we're going to take a look at is how this whole world, all of the principalities, all of the powers, all of these things work for God. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, with the uh, here in uh, America, with this election coming up, this presidential election. Honestly, who, whoever God wants to be in office, that's who's going to be in office. And we don't have to be afraid of nothing, because when we serve in the true and living God, he going to take care of us. All right. We're not affected by these evil things that's taking place in the world when we are serving God and when we focused on him. So we don't have no reason to be afraid. Whoever win, that's who God wanted to win. Simple as that. He ruling the kingdom of God and men. He calling all of the shots. And not only that, he is the world's boss. He telling everybody what to do. So let's open up this Bible study so we can get some understanding on this subject. Let's go and take a look at this in Colossians 1. Colossians 1. And let's have a look at Colossians 1. Let's read verse 12 and then we're going to skip down. We're going to read verse 12 just to show you who's in control. And then we're going to skip down and see how he created everything for himself, which is God. This is who created everything. So Colossians 1. And let's read verse 12. And uh, if I move too fast, just pause the video. Because we, we just going to let the spirit flow today. Whatever come up, hey, that's what it is. But Colossians 1, and uh, let's take a look at verse 12. And then we'll skip down and read verses 15 through 17. But right now, it says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So we give thanks to the Father for sending his son, Jesus Christ, to repair the relationship that was broken because of the sin that we committed. And ultimately, Adam is the one that introduced sin into the world. So therefore, death passed upon all men, 
But the Lord redeemed us from this death sentence by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to be a sacrifice and a sin offering for us. He's our atonement. But let's skip down and take a look at verse 15 now. Because we're going to truly see who is in control. It said, who is the image of the invisible God? This is Jesus. He the God that the people saw. All right. So he is the image of the invisible God. That's why Jesus said, when you see me, you seen the father. He said the firstborn of every creature. Jesus Christ is the firstborn or the first one to die and be resurrected from the grave and be alive forevermore with an immortal body. All right. So he came in the flesh, died and resurrected and got an immortal body. So it says for by him were all things created. That are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So all of the uh, systems, all of these things, the governments, the, he said these things were created by him and for him. God has a purpose for everything that's here in this uh, planet, family, and the way everything is operating. He says, and he is before all things and by him, all things consist. Everything is composed of or made up of him. He created all things with his word family. All right. So let's go and take a look at something else just to show you who is in control. Because over here and uh, what was it? Uh, first Timothy six. Let's take a look at first Timothy six over here. Uh, Paul used this word. That's called potentate, which is a sovereign ruler with all power. So we're going to take a look at this and see who got all power. And we know it's none other than the father in Jesus Christ. But let's read the scriptures. First Timothy six. Let's read verses 13 through 16. And let's see what Paul was writing to Timothy in this epistle. He says, I give thee charge in the sight of God. Who quickeneth all things. God is the one who make all things alive, family. He said, and before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed the good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate the king of kings and lord of lords. So he is a king over all of the other kings. He's a sovereign ruler. Let's go and take a look at this definition first, though, before we go any further. So we're going to have a look at this definition out of the Pictorial Bible Dictionary. And we'll take a look at page uh, 673. All right, so let's have a look at this. And it reads, potentate. It says, dynasties, mighty one, a person with great power and authority. Didn't the father commit all power and authority under Jesus? He told us that, right? In the scriptures, as a matter of fact, he said he gave all things unto his hand. And then in, uh, what was it? Matthew 28, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So Jesus Christ is this potentate king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We lay in a foundation for this Bible study family, just in case anybody is confused about who is in control. And it's Jesus that's in control. And also Jesus is a dignity. He is the one that rules over everything and everybody. He tell everybody what to do. So he says the Greek word is used of men in Luke 1 and 52, the mighty in Acts 8 and 27. KJV of great authority. Jesus Christ indeed has great authority, fam. All right, so let's continue looking at this. Because honestly, you know, it don't matter who win an election. Whatever's going on, God is in control. At the end of the day, we go through this, what, every four years, every eight years, it's a new president that's being elected over here. I don't know how it, it works in other countries. Uh, I know some of the <clears throat> some of the other countries that's ruled by prime ministers and uh, monarchs and stuff like that. I believe they rule until uh, they die out of office. But nevertheless, let's continue looking at this. 
So it says, going back to 1 Timothy uh, 6 and 16 now, it says, who only have immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. So Jesus is dwelling with the Father. That's that light that no man can approach unto. It says, whom no man hath seen nor can see. Once again, referring back to the Father. To whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Jesus Christ is infinite in power. In his kingdom, when he set it up on this earth, it'll never be put to end. It'll never have an end. It's going to be an eternal kingdom. So now let's continue looking at this just to solidify the fact that Jesus Christ is a king. Not only is he a king, he a lawgiver, a judge, and he a king. He's everything. Isaiah 33. Let's take a look at verse 22. Isaiah 33 and verse 22. And it reads, for the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? He the king of kings and the Lord of lords, family. He our judge. He our lawgiver. And he's our savior. He will save us. Remember, cursed is the man that put his trust in a man. Let me just let me flash it on the screen just just in case anybody uh, think I'm just saying something just to be saying something. But hang on. Let me let me show you this. This is Jeremiah 17 and five. It says, thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth in man and make it flesh his arm and whose heart departed from the Lord. So it ain't no way you should be putting your trust in any one of these politicians and no other man to save you. Only the Lord. That's why our trust and our faith need to be placed at. Not in who wins the election. You cursed if you put your trust in a man. Why are we going to be afraid of a man whose breath is in his nostrils? The moth going to walk over his grave like it talk about in Job 4. Think we about to be worried about who went. Man, look, God is in control. This is a spiritual reality that we live in here, family. It's spiritual with God being the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So now, since we've seen that the Lord is our judge and our lawgiver and he our king and he the one that's going to save us, we shouldn't be putting no trust in no man. But let's go back now. Let's back up a little bit because we want to show that the Lord is the one who actually appoints these people to their office. Let's go and take a look at this. Romans 13. Romans 13. And let's have a look at verse 1. Romans 13 and verse 1. And let's take a look at this. It don't matter who wins. God is still the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's the one we need to be serving. Yes, of course, we pay attention to what's going on around us. And, you know, we live in our everyday lives. But ultimately, God is the one that's calling all of the shots, family. He the one that's setting up these rulers and doing all of these things. So let's have a look at this. Romans 13. Let's read verses 1 through 4. But I suggest you go back and read this whole thing on your own whenever you get an uh, opportunity. So let's take a look. Romans 13. And let's have a look at verse 1. Let's read 1 through 4. So it says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. That's what Jesus was talking about over there uh, when they was trying to trip him up uh, uh, with, with paying t uh, taxes to Caesar. So, yeah, we follow the rules. So we got to be subject to the higher powers. And here's why. Because God is the one that set these people up. It says, for there is no power but of God. If anybody got any power, any form of office, it came from God. He says, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whoever is in office, whoever is in control, God appointed them. That's what the scriptures are saying. And, and surely we should be able to hear what Paul is saying because Paul, he was, he talked to Jesus in his strength when he knocked them down on that way to, uh, uh, on that road to Damascus. So clearly what Paul is saying, it has to be true. It says, whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God. 
So if you are bucking against the system, you actually, you bucking against God because he is the one that set these individuals up, whether they be good or evil. God control all of this. All of these things is working together for his purpose. He got a reason for doing all of this. This is what we need to remember. It says, whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So you go against God's uh, authority, you're going to find yourself facing damnation. He says, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. So, you know, normally, for the most part, you know, and I'm, I'm going to just keep it real. We live here in Chicago, which is probably one of the most racist and segregated cities in the United States of America. But when you ain't doing, when you ain't out here on no folly, the police ain't bothering you. They not just going to harass you for no reason. They don't happen like that. When you serving the Lord, man, these people, they don't want to have nothing to do with you. It's all spiritual. So once again, they not a terror to good works, but to the evil. And that's not to say you don't have no crooked cops out here. But once again, even God is in control of that. If these people are being unjust, God is the one that rule in the kingdom of God and men. And we'd have been witnesses to some things. How the Lord can take over a judge and tell a judge, let this person go. Get him out of my courtroom. Let him go free. Give him his license back. These type of things happen because God is the one that rule in that kingdom of God and men. So anyway, the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. So if you ain't out here on no folly or doing something bogus, you ain't got nothing to worry about. It says, will thou then not be afraid of the power? You're not going to have respect to the power when God is the one that set them up. It says, do that which is good and thou shalt have praise of the same. Be a good law abiding citizen <laughs> and you're going to be good. God will praise you for doing the right thing because family, a servant of God, he has to have a good report with the household of faith and with the ones that's outside of the faith. You're supposed to be a light. We're not here to overthrow no system or do nothing like that. We, hey, look, it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ and his father. He says, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. So, you know, I know that the, uh, the, the logo on the police cars to serve and protect. And, you know, if you didn't have no police here in Chicago, if you didn't have no police at all, imagine how rampant crime would be. So once again, God is the one that's ruling in the kingdom of God and men. It says, but if thou do that, which is evil, be afraid. Of course you should be afraid. If you doing what's evil, you paranoid, you're looking for something to come back and God going to get you. Simple as that. It says, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So the powers that be, they're not looking to punish nobody that's doing good. They're looking for the ones who going against the system, which the system is the thing that God set up. He ordained these rulers, family. I'm just reading this to show you who in control. So now let's go back and take a look at this again, because God told Jeremiah something when they were getting ready to be going into captivity by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar and the Lord told Jeremiah go and tell these nations or go and tell the kings of Hezekiah let's just go and read it Jeremiah 27 let's take a look at Jeremiah 27 and let's have a look at verse 1 let's read Jeremiah 27 and let's read verses 1 through 7 Jeremiah 27 and verses 1 through 7 and it reads in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, came this word unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying. So the Lord is giving Jeremiah a, a word to speak to these kings. Now, let's see what he said or to this king. It says, thus saith the Lord to me, make thee bonds and yokes and put them upon thy neck. 
and send them to the king of Edom and to the king of Moab and to the king of the Ammonites and to the king of Tyrus and to the king of Zion, Zidon by the hand of the messengers which come to Jerusalem unto Zedekiah king of Judah. So he said, make you yokes because everybody was about to be under Nebuchadnezzar's rulership. Because God appointed Nebuchadnezzar, the first world ruling Gentile, to run the whole world. And it's still this way today. Let's continue looking at this. Because the Lord said that the Gentiles was going to reign until the Lord made his return. Until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The time of the Gentiles ain't fulfilled until after the tribulation is over. That's when the Lord coming back. Because they the last kingdom to be ruling this earth until the Lord come back. So we getting close, family. Taking a look at all of the things that's happening. We getting close. As far as all of the signs that the Lord said was going to be taking place in the last days. But anyway, verse 4. It says, and commanded them to say unto their masters. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Thus shall ye say unto your masters. I have made the earth. The man and the beast that are upon the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given it unto whom is seen me unto me. God said, I made this whole earth. I made every beast, every human, every plant on this planet. He said, and I give it to who is seen me unto me. All right. So let's continue looking at this. So let's take a look at. Mm, excuse me verse 6 now so he says and now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon my servant and the beast of the field have I given him also to serve him so this is why even to this very day you want to go out there and hunt you want to go fish do any of those uh, wildlife activities where you taking beasts out of the earth, such as fishing or hunting, you got to get a permit. Guess who running the offices to get the permit? The wildlife uh, uh, authorities or whatever. You got to go and get a permit from them. Guess who run it? Nebuchadnezzar's sons. Let's see what else he said. Verse seven. He says, and all nations shall serve him. God set this up, right? Didn't he tell Jeremiah to go and tell these uh, king, the kings of uh, Moab, Edom, the king of the Ammonites, uh, the king of Tyrus and Zidon? Y'all going to be subject to Nebuchadnezzar. So God is the one that appointed Nebuchadnezzar, the world ruling king over these other nations. So once again, he the one who get a kingdom to who he wants to. He says, and all nations shall serve him and his sons and his son's sons until the very time of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. So eventually, many nations and great kings, the, the, the script is going to be flipped. People going to be eating the riches of the Gentiles pretty soon after they rulership is over with. But we just taking a look at how God is the one that appointed Nebuchadnezzar. So let's go back to the beginning now. Because the children of Israel, see, first of all, we wouldn't even have to be going through any of this if our forefathers would have kept the commandments. But let's take a look at this because it was commandment. It's, it's written in the law that when Israel was ruling and we had our own kings, we wasn't supposed to be setting up no strangers over us. Our kings were supposed to come up, up out of our own nation. So quite frankly, seeing as how we scattered over in the captivity and seeing as how Jesus Christ is still a king of kings and the Lord of lords, he the one that we serve. He's our king. We don't put no trust in these flesh and blood human beings. Let's go back and take a look at this. Let's go back and read something in Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17, and let's have a look at this. Deuteronomy 17, 
And let's take a look at verse 14. Deuteronomy 17 and verse 14. Now pay attention to what God told to the children of Israel when they were setting up a king over them. What did he say? Deuteronomy 17 and 14, it says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. God already knew that Israel was going to be asking for a king like all of the other nations. And right after this, we're going to take a look and see how they did this. And the excuse that they gave, it, it wasn't a good one. Because Samuel's sons, they were judges and they started, you know, going out of order, taking bribes and doing things that weren't right. So then the nation of Israel got to complaining and they wanted a king like all of the other nations. And that's the problem. We want to be like everybody else and then everybody else want to be like us. Like, what's the what's going on, man? So once again, we need to be trying to be like God. He says. Verse 15, he says, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. So once again, when Israel was in the land or when they was going to set up a king, when they was when they were in their own land. When we were in our own land, there couldn't be another king ruling over us that wasn't out of another nation. All right. So let's skip down and take a look at this now. Let's skip down and take a look at verses 18 through 20. It says, and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom. So when you do set a king over you, this is what this king should be doing. Now, pay attention to this. It says, and it shall be when he setteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read therein all the days of his life. Guess what? The king, he had to read the Bible or the book of the law every day. And here's why. It says that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Now ask yourself this question. Are these people that's being elected president, these are these elected officials, are they promoting God's word like that? What are they promoting? Policies that don't have nothing to do with none of us, really. All right, so once again, the king was supposed to be reading out of the book of the law to learn to fear the Lord their God because he that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of the Lord. Because we know what happened when evil rulers are in, uh, uh, in rulership, the people mourn. People hate when evil rulers are in rulership because that affects, that has a, 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 an effect on the whole landscape, the world. Is affected by these things. So it says, verse 20, here's another reason why he had to read out of the book of the law every day. It said that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Yeah, just because you're the king, that don't mean you better than nobody. You're still a human being. So he was reading the law to stay humble, which is what a lot of these people that's elected offic officials, they're not really humble. Matter of fact, they got a lot of pride. So they're not humble because they have no fear of the Lord. So once again, it says that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn out aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom. He and his children in the midst of Israel. So he had to read a book of the law. The king had to do this now. To make sure he don't be lifted up above his brethren or his heart be lifted up and that he could fear the Lord, the, his God, all the days of his life. So let's continue looking at this. First Samuel eight. Because I mentioned it, but let's go and read it. First Samuel eight, because Israel, 
eventually wound up asking for a king. And the Lord told them what type of king or kings will be ruling over them. You can go back and look at it on your own. We're going to look at it a few things, but it wasn't going to be good. And the Lord said, when you get into when you get into trouble, don't come crying out to me asking about, you know, save me from this. Because that's what you asked for. The Lord gave you what you wanted. So let's go and take a look at this. First Samuel 8. Let's read 1 through 11. And then we'll skip down and look at verses 20, uh, 16 through 22. So let's have a look at this. So it says, and it came to pass when Samuel was old. That he made his sons judges over Israel. So they was ruling. They was judging the matters in the nation of Israel. It says, now the name of his firstborn was Joel. And the name of the second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways. But turned aside after lucre. And took bribes and perverted judgment. So they was perverting judgment. They was getting paid off. To turn the other, look the other way, although somebody was being done wrong, much like these wicked politicians now, is what they do. Politicians, lawyers, judges, they take bribes. And wrong in the ones that's right. It says, then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, behold, thou art old. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. God be knowing what's going to happen before it even happened. In Deuteronomy 17, where we just got done reading, they wasn't even in the land yet. They were still walking around in the wilderness. But the Lord told Moses to tell the children of Israel, when you start asking for a king, this is the type of king you need to set over you. But let's see what happened when they asked for a king because God was their king. God is still our king. But let's continue. It says, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. So Samuel had some understanding that God was the king. You asking for a king because what somebody else is doing. Look, let the Lord deal with these people. You know, he going to do it. There's never been a history in a time of mankind. When man just did whatever he wanted to do and God didn't get him for that. God don't play. So let's continue. It says, and the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. He said, man, they ain't reject you, Samuel. They rejected me from ruling over them. So you thought you was going to get some comfort from a man ruling over you? Although Sam, uh, uh, Samuel's sons was out of order? Why not just pray to the Lord about his sons? Why you got to ask for a king like everybody else? He says, according to the works, verse 8. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. He said, these people ain't changed. They have not changed. He says, now therefore hearken unto their voice. How be it yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. He said, okay, listen to what they saying, but let them know what type of king they gonna have ruling over them. It says, and Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked him of a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. In other words, your people, they're going to be working for the king. Whereas you should have just had the Lord uh, uh, as your king. And he wouldn't have done all of these things that uh, this these kings would have done. Let's see what else they was going to do. Let's skip down to verse 16. It says, and he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. He said, man, they're going to take the best of whatever you got, the goodliest of your young men, and he's going to have them working for him. Whereas you could have just been working for the Lord. But hey, this is the type of king that you want. This is what you're going to get. 
This is what you asking for. This is why sometimes, man, it's best to just keep your mouth closed and ask God to pray for you. Give me what's best for me according to your will, Lord. Let's continue looking at this. It says he will take the 10th of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. Well, at, at, at a certain point over here in, in America, they had a time when they were drafting people to fight in the army or fight in the uh, wars and things like that. So let's continue looking at this. He says, nevertheless, no, no, no. Verse 18, it says, And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king, which ye, have, which ye shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. He said he not going to hear you because he was, he was warning you about the type of king that was going to be ruling over you. So when you get to crying out and being afflicted, he said he not going to listen to you because you wasn't listening to him when he was telling you what type of king you was going to get ruling over you. He says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, nay, but we will have a king over us. Man, this is ridiculous. So what's going on here, just in case you don't know, the children of Israel is being told what type of king they was going to have ruling over them in the flesh. So what they doing is they rejecting the spiritual king, which is God, and asking for a physical king like the rest of the nations which is a slap in the face to God. But verse 20, it says that we may be, that we may also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Well, God was going out fighting the battles. God was the judge. We already read in Isaiah 33 and 22, the Lord is our judge, our lawgiver, and he's our king and he will save us. But let's continue. And even when you go back and look at, what was it, uh, Exodus 14? Moses told the children of Israel in a mixed multitude, hold your peace, for the Lord will fight for you. Didn't he say that? So why are you over here worried about a king fighting for you? And the Lord is a man of war. But anyway, he said that over there in uh, Exodus 14 and 13 through 14. All right, the Lord is a man of war. He said, the Lord is his name. But going back over here, 1 Samuel 8, and let's take a look at verse 21 now. It says, and Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. So Samuel just went back and told the Lord everything that the uh, people said. It says, and the Lord said to Samuel, hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto a city. So he said, the Lord told him, go and listen to what he asked, what, what they asking you for. So clearly we can see that it displeased God that they were asking for a physical king to rule over them when God is their king. Look at Abraham. Abraham knew the Lord as the judge and the high priest or the king and the high priest. So Abraham had the understanding that God was the king. Abraham and his men, they weren't asking for no physical king because he understood that the spiritual king, which is God in heaven, he was the king. So now let's continue looking at this. Let's skip over and take a look because eventually over here in Jeremiah 29, the Lord was letting Jeremiah tell the people, hey, look, y'all about to go into captivity. And this is what you need to do when you go into captivity. So let's take a look at this in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. And let's have a look at verse 1. And then we'll skip down and read a little bit. Jeremiah 29 and verse 1. So it reads, Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives. So some of the uh, people that were still in the land from when Nebuchadnezzar was taking the captives away. these Some of these people were still there. It says, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. So he took them from out of Jerusalem and brought them down to Babylon. They not in their own land. So let's continue reading. Let's skip down to verse, uh, let's read verse four. So it says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, 
the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. The Lord said, I caused Jerusalem to be carried away into Babylon because they were rebellion, rebellion or in rebellion. Going contrary to what thus saith the Lord. Why they were in their own land. So it says, build ye houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that ye may be increased there and not diminished. So he said, go ahead and get comfortable. Reproduce because I don't want y'all being diminished, but you're going into captivity. He says, and seek the peace of the city where I, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. God is the one that caused Jerusalem or Israel to be carried away captive into Babylon. Much like the Atlantic slave trade. Israel was going to, and, and it's the so-called African-American, just in case you don't know who Israel is. They was going and being spread all around the world. Because we were disobedient to God and the Lord poured out his judgment on us. This is the reason for slavery and captivity. He says, and seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. So he said, pray for the peace of the city. Because when the peace of the city is here, you can benefit from the peace of the city. In the peace shall you have peace. So when it's a peaceful city, you're going to have peace. All right. So this is what happened. They got carried away captive and the Lord told them to get comfortable because you're going to be there for a while. And we still in captivity, even to this very day. So now let's go and take a look at something else because he talked about praying for the peace of the city and ain't nothing changed. Paul had the same idea. Let's take a look at this. And 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2. And let's have a look at verses 1 through 4. Because we're going to see what Paul is saying is the same thing that Jeremiah was told to let the people know. So 1 Timothy 2. Let's take a look at verse 1. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1. And it reads, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty so he said i'm praying that you pray for the peace of the city for all of the kings and everybody that's in authority so we need to be praying for a righteous ruler he says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. So this is what we should be doing. And if it's good and acceptable in the sight of our, our Lord and Savior, this is what we should be doing. Because we should always be seeking to please him no matter what. All right, so let's continue. He says, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So the Lord, he want all men to be saved and all men to come unto the knowledge of who he is. Who the father in Jesus Christ is, because Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And he want all men to come unto him this way. All right. So now let's continue looking at this. Since we over here in this region of the Bible, let's take a look at something in Second Timothy. Second Timothy two. And let's read verses three through four. And it reads, <clears throat> Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Christ. So whatever we got to deal with for Christ's sake, that's what we got to deal with. Thank God for blessing us with the strength to be able to endure. So it says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. We shouldn't be getting involved and arguing about, oh, yeah, so-and-so should be the president and this and this and this. We ain't supposed to be getting caught up in that stuff. We need to be focusing on the king of kings and lord of lords, pleasing him. 
so let's back up now. Let's go and take a look at something else since we over here. Second Timothy one, because a lot of times people become afraid, you know, worrying about what's going to happen, how things going to change. Don't worry about that. Focus on God. Second Timothy one in verse seven. Look at this. It says, for God have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God ain't gave us that spirit of fear. We shouldn't be fearing whoever get in office. We should have an understanding that God is in control. Remember that. So now let's match this precept up. Let's go back over here to Proverbs. Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3. And let's take a look. Proverbs 3. Let's read 1 through 2. And then let's skip down and read verses 21 through 26. Let's read this. I mean, because the Bible is alive, family. This is the real deal right here. This is this is the true word of God right here. Let's take a look. Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 2. And it reads, my son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. So we need to be hiding God's word in our heart and doing what's pleasing to him at all times. He says, for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. When we keep in God's commandments, they're going to add length of days, long life and peace to us. So that's what we need to be focusing on. Being obedient to the eternal king of kings and Lord of lords. All right. So now. Let's skip down and take a look at verses 21 through 26. It says, my son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. So this is what's going to sustain us. God's grace and his mercy through keeping his commandments. He says, then shalt thou walk in thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. So it don't matter who ruling. When you obeying God and keeping what thus saith the Lord, man, you ain't got to worry about nothing. He going to let us know that. He said, when thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yeah, thou shalt lie down and thy sleep shall be sweet. You going to go to bed like a little baby. Sweet sleep and you ain't worried about nothing. It says, be not afraid of sudden fear. Neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. So when things suddenly come Start jumping off. God said, don't be afraid or anxious about none of that. Why is that? For the Lord shall be thy confidence. Oh, man. Let me let me re rewind this. He said, for the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. So who going to sustain us? Who our confidence? The Lord, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We ain't got nothing to be afraid of. Matter of fact. Let's go and take a look at something over in Isaiah 51. We're going to show you. God even said it over here by the mouth of Isaiah. Man, who are you? Why are you going to be afraid of a man whose breath is in his nostrils? He going to die one day. The God that we serve, our eternal king, he ain't never dying. Isaiah 51. He alive and he, he going to be alive forevermore. Isaiah 51. Let's read verses 12 through 13 and it reads, I... Even I am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die and of the son of man which shall be made grass? He said, who you, who you going to be afraid of, of a man that's going to die? He says, and forget us the Lord thy maker. He the one that made us. Don't be so caught up on these elections and things that's going on in the world that we lose focus of who God is. He says, and forget us the Lord thy maker that have stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor as if he were ready to destroy. And where is the fury of the oppressor? He said, man, man, don't be afraid of these people. Do not be afraid of these people. What, what you afraid of these people for? Whoever in control, wh whoever's going to uh, uh, get in the office, it don't matter who it's going to be. The Lord is in control. He running everything, fam. All right. So let's go and take a look at something else. We're going to start wrapping this up. Let's go and look at something else. Let's go over here and look at this. What was it? Isaiah 2. 
Isaiah 2, just to match up what he said in Isaiah uh, 51. Look at what he said over here. Isaiah 2 and verse 22, he says, Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Man, don't be afraid of no man. His breath is in his nostrils. God is eternal. So we shouldn't be afraid of no man. Let's go and let King David tell us too. Psalms 27, verse 1. Let's see what King David had to say about this. And King David, just to remind you, he was a man after God's own heart, always seeking to please the Lord. Although he himself was a king. King David is a perfect example of a righteous king. So let's have a look at this. Psalms 27 and verse 1. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Like Keith Sweat said, nobody. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Once again, nobody. When the Lord is the strength of your life, when the Lord is our defense and our offense, who are we going to be afraid of? Nobody. But let's let the scriptures tell us and we're going to let it rest right here on this note. Let's let the scriptures tell us who we should be afraid of. Because this is the one that we're going to have to stand in front of at the end of the day. Let's go and see who we should be afraid of. Matthew 10. Let's take a look at verses 27 through 28. And then right after this, we're going to conclude this Bible study and uh, continue on with the mission statement of the channel, which is to turn the hearts of the people back to God. So Matthew 10, let's take a look at verses 27 through 28. And it reads, what I tell you in darkness that speak ye in light and what ye hear in the ear that preach ye upon the housetops. So you all weren't here when I was composing this lesson when the lord was whispering to me the scriptures to put down but you see it being broadcasted right now on this live stream although you all weren't there now watch this it says and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul so he said don't fear the one don't fear no human being because they can't destroy you completely god can though he says, but rather fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That's who we need to be afraid of. That's who we pay reverence and homage to God. All right. So with that being said, we gonna let it rest right there. And that was don't be afraid of who elect who is elected president. God rules over kings. All right. So now let's continue on with the mission statement of the channel, which is to turn the whole everybody back to god everybody that tune in over here on this bible study channel and even if you're not tuning in when you take it to somebody they need to be turning back to the lord it's all about glorifying the father in jesus name and getting salvation family that's what this lifestyle is about but let's take a look at this psalms 38 and verse 18 this is what we all need to do like king david said over here he said for i will declare mine iniquity I will be sorry for my sin. That's what we all need to do. Confess our sins and repent and be baptized in the almighty name of Jesus Christ if we haven't done so already. All right. So now let's go and let the word rest on us and may God bless us according to what's written over here in number six and 22 through 27. So let's have a look at this. Number six. Verses 22. Through 27 and it reads and the Lord spake unto Moses saying speak unto Aaron and unto his sons saying on this wise ye shall bless the children of Israel saying unto them the Lord bless thee and keep thee the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace and they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them in Jesus' name, may it be so for every last one of us, family. In Jesus' name. So now, let's go and take a look at this over here. And we're going to let it rest right after this. So we're going to see Paul telling the Philippians something that was said over in Isaiah 45. Let's take a look at this. Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Let's read it. 
It says, wherefore, God also have highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father in Jesus name. Amen. So once again, family, as always, it's a pleasure sitting down, studying and reading what thus saith the Lord with every last one of you all. I pray that the Lord continue to bless our households with strength, faith and protection from the wicked devil that's out here trying to devour each and every one of us, family. All right. So with that being said, I love you all so much and may the spirit of God continue to rest upon each and every one of us. And Lord willing, we'll be back tomorrow with another topic out of the Holy Scriptures. Until then, peace in the almighty name of Jesus.